After seeing the events unfold in Crimea, I came into work last week knowing that it might be my last day because I felt morally obligated to speak out against the editorial line of my employer. When I broke that set, the call was heard around the world by every mainstream media outlet imaginable. I picked up on the fact that a journalist working on a Russian-backed TV station was admonishing Russia, the focal point of indignant fervor around the world. But I wasn't simply calling out Russia. I was calling out the U.S. as well as every other global superpower that pits the people of other countries against each other as pawns to push a broader agenda of imperialism. Despite what the onslaught of hit pieces and the wickedy insanity said, I'm not anti-West or anti-Russia. I am pro-peace and pro-diplomacy. But above all, I have ethical consistency of an anti-military track record as well as a strong moral compass of empathy, compassion, and the rule of law. RT is funded by public grants in Russia in the same way that Al Jazeera is in BBC in Britain and Qatar. Yet every newscast I heard was prefaced with the reminder that RT is Kremlin funded. Or it was introduced with a de declaration that RT is widely considered a 24-hour propaganda network. Above all, I still have my job, which I think shocked people more than ever. You see, the fact that I might have more editorial freedom or leniency within the ranks than the majority of corporate-funded news outlets doesn't sit too well. But let me ask you this. When was the last time you saw the National Defense Authorization Act covered on corporate TV? Or Nestle's privatization of water around the earth? Or Monsanto's stronghold on food labeling in this country? Or what about the plight of the Oglala Sioux Native Americans at Pine Ridge? When it comes to cheerleading in America's wars, well, don't even get me started. See, six corporate giant conglomerates control nearly 90% of all media Americans consume. And let's be honest, the paradigm pushed by these outlets fits into a box that marginalizes radical thought and third-party voices. And there are far too many instances of establishment reporters either getting fired or resigning for speaking out against the editorial line of their network or for simply going against their advertisers. Like in 1999, when two Fox reporters named Jane Aker and Steve Wilson attempted to air a story about the dangers of genetically modified bovine growth hormone. And they were subsequently blocked from airing the report because of threats from Monsanto. And then there's NBC's Peter Arnett, who was immediately fired for making critical commentary about the Iraq war on Iraqi television. A memo from management made it very clear the reason was because he, quote, put a difficult face on the public for NBC in a time of war. Moving on to MSNBC's Phil Donahue, a news host who had a 29-year run on national TV. He was also fired because of his open criticism of the Iraq invasion. As Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Chris Hedges so aptly said, that moment was a time that commercial television decided amassing corporate money and providing entertainment was its central mission. And then there's a woman named Andrea Seabrook, a former NPR reporter on the Hill who resigned in protest of impartiality. She came on breaking the set to tell me how fed up she was with essentially reprinting government press releases. She actually called the incestuous relationship between reporters and politicians on the Hill collusion. And most recently, there's CBS News investigator Cheryl Atkinson, who resigned out of her contract early, citing that she was frustrated with the network's bias and pressure from its corporate partners. After the dissent at RT became viral, a former writer for the Democratic website Think Progress also wrote an article saying that he felt suffocating pressure reporting in D.C. and that his network would get berated with phone calls from the White House if he criticized the administration. This type of self-censorship is nothing new. It comes with the territory of working for any large media outlet funded by questionable entities. Except the difference with corporate media is that there are literally hundreds of conflicts of interest fueling their editorial lines. So we're here to go over a topic of censorship and truth in media. I'm joined now by investigative journalist and former CN reporter Amber Lyon. Amazing to have you on, Amber. Thank you, Abby, so much for having me. It's an honor. So Amber, you famously left CNN after working there for years, citing reasons of censorship. Can you talk about what happened with your documentary that you filmed in Bahrain for the network? Yeah, we produced this documentary exposing that this Bahrain regime, the regime the United States had been supporting financially and with weapons, that this same regime was actually even using some of those weapons to torture and murder its people. And after we produced this documentary, we were told by CNN International that the documentary wasn't going to air. And we were given almost no explanation, Abby, as to why they chose not to air this documentary. And after further investigation, we found out that Bahrain was a paying customer at the network at CNN, that Bahrain
Ukraine and several other pro-United States regimes worldwide are actually paying CNN to produce positive content and fake documentaries about them, which I consider to be infomercials for dictators. And I think that CNN sprinkles this into their programming with little or no disclosure to viewers and their own journalists, and, and it's really defrauding viewers and, and really misleading people, Abby. Well, that is fascinating, Amber. What I find most interesting is that every time I talk about self-censorship to people like Piers Morgan or Bob Garfield on NPR, they are all shocked. They're like, what are you talking about? We never self-censor. I mean, do you think that this is a big issue in the press today? It's a tremendously big issue, Abby. A lot of the muckraking journalists have actually had to leave the mainstream, including myself, because we just can't do our jobs on these networks because there is so much censorship. In 10 years of working in the mainstream, I was censored on stories at every single one of my jobs, whether that be to please corporate interests or the story was censored to please the United States government. So this is a chronic problem that's really destroying journalism in the United States. And people really need to understand when you're watching the mainstream media, you're not getting uh, the accurate picture. A lot of the journalists have been turned into lap dogs versus watchdogs uh, because that's what management wants. Right, I mean, as I was just mentioning, two reporters that have basically said that they resigned because they were sick of reprinting government press releases. I mean, this is the way it works on the Hill here, Amber. I mean, as someone who's worked in the establishment media for so long, how would you say the editorial process works when people pitch stories they want to cover? I mean, do most journalists have that editorial freedom? No, they don't. And, and I didn't have that when I was at CNN. And you're talking about that close, cozy relationship between Washington reporters and the U.S. government. While I was at CNN, I'd actually have other journalists, journalists at CNN, write me and call me and ask me to amend my stories in favor of the U.S. government or government entities. They would call me on behalf of the U.S. government to change my stories, which I often refuse to do. But, I mean, that's just the nature of what's going on there. These, uh, a lot of these journalists have uh, cozy, cozy relationships with authorities that, that are very questionable. They're, they're doing more propaganda than they are actually investigative journalism. And two, there's a message sent from the top down to journalists in these newsrooms as to what's appropriate to cover and what's not. Case in point, the Occupy movement. Almost instantly when the Occupy movement started, management made it seem like it was an annoying movement. Like viewers didn't want to see what was happening on the streets, like they were just some, you know, hippies with no important message. And one executive at CNN, I was sitting down at dinner with him, actually told me that Occupy didn't deserve to be covered. And so when this is sent from the top down, this kind of message as to what you should be reporting on, it really influences what you end up seeing on, on the TV at the end of the day, Abby. Uh, Amber, you bring up a really good point, and, and you know it's really, really interesting that you were talking about Bahrain actually funding these networks. Because I think when people think of corporate media, the last thing they're thinking of is actually tyrannical establishments or regimes from around the world actually also funding. Uh, how much do you think that an unchallenged establishment by mainstream journalists is due to a loss of access to sources? I, I think that is one of the main causes. You know, I, I think that right now we're just not seeing investigative journalism, and and so the corrupt are getting away with with whatever they choose because there's not a lot of investigation, Abby. Right, and, and you know, you mentioned before the Occupy Wall Street thing, and and I really I wish that I would have told Piers Morgan, you know, censorship isn't really just the black hand of the, of the advertiser or the state, the black hand of a story, it's framing and it's bias as well. There's so many different elements of censorship in the way that you can portray a story or marginalize and minimize a story. Amber, RT's funded in the same way Al Jazeera and BBC are. Why do you think the establishment press looks at RT so differently than those networks? Well, it's almost like they're trying to revive the Cold War mentality at a disturbing and dangerous level, Abby, and oftentimes, you mention, uh, you, you point out the atrocities of the United States government constantly, but they just didn't pick up on that. Instead, they took your statements um, against Putin's actions as a chance to kind of revive this anti-Russia mentality, this dangerous mentality that they're spreading. And I, I find it very suspicious, Abby, that when you do speak out against uh, the West and uh, against corrupt corporations, there's just silence. There, there's no international headlines from that, but uh, they definitely took your message and misconstrued it and, and, then, and then covered it worldwide. And of course, uh, you know, 
trying to marginalize me when they realized that I wasn't that kind of anti-Russian pawn that they were looking for to promote their Cold War narrative, Amber. It's really scary to kind of see myself, <laughs> you know, criticizing the corporate media every day and to see myself as kind of the pawn being used in this machine, chewed up, spit out. I mean, as an objective viewer watching all of that unfold, what do you think about the way the media has been covering the crisis in Ukraine? Do you think they've been covering it responsibly? I don't think they've been covering it responsibly. They've been really trying to actively uh, ignite a war and, and also trying to mislead the public and make them think that a war is necessary. And, and it just reminds me of, of what happened right before we were led into uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. They're just beating the drums of war. They're glamorizing war. They're making it seem like this is the necessary next step, which, which is not the case. And it's, it's very dangerous, Abby, and it's it's just like history's repeating itself once again. And we both know that peace is always the answer. Diplomacy, um, always. I mean, it's insane to see a, a corporate media apparatus actually trying to advocate military intervention and action um, against another global superpower. I mean, have we forgotten the lessons of the Cold War here? You know, I understand that white people don't trust any mainstream network, including RT. But Amber, shouldn't people judge journalism on its content instead of dismissing entire media sources based on where the funding may come from? Exactly, and I think the best advice, people ask me all the time, who can I trust, who can I not trust? I think the best advice is to follow the journalist, not follow the entity. So if you find a journalist who you feel is telling the truth and, and isn't bowing down to corporations and various governments worldwide, then you should follow their work because, and as in your case, Abby, if they maintain their moral compass, they're going to stick to that line and you can trust their journalism. I think uh, there are very few entities worldwide right now producing journalism that you can trust as a whole. So just pick out the individual journalists who you know are, are going to stand by the people at all costs. Uh, very good advice, Amberline. You are one of those people. You're a journalist secure to me. Everyone check out muckraker.com. Coming soon. Always amazing to have you on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's our show, you guys. Join me again tomorrow when I break